The locust plague in parts of the Northern Cape, Western Cape and Eastern Cape Karoo is by far the biggest outbreak in the past 25 years, according to locust expert Dr. Roger Price. He visits us in studio this morning to elaborate on the extent of this outbreak. En vandaag zijn nieuws Ian Cunningham is van die vier tijdens een gala geleentijd in Durban wil als die Agri Weeskap Santam Landbouw Jongboer van die jaar aangewijs. Ian boer met zachte vruchten in wijndruiven op Elgin in Verliersdorp. Janis Strijdom uitvoerende hoof van Agri Weeskap sê van jaar zijn deelnemers was allemaal sterk kandidaten, maar dat Cunningham aan al die competities streng criteria voldoen het. Hy sal die Weeskap verteenwoordig wanneer die nationale winner van die Toyota SA Agri SA Jongboer van die jaar competitie aangewijs wordt. The sought-after annual Supreme Cow Gold Cup Award at the Royal Show in Peter Maritzburg this year went to River Valley Simmentaler. The Supreme Bull Gold Cup went to Devlin Limousines. The awards form part of the interbreed competition held at Royal Show this week. Dan View Brahmans also performed exceptionally well, winning the best group of four beef bull category for one exhibitor. Best group of five beef cattle in the category for both sexes shown by one exhibitor and the sire progeny group of four beef cattle in the category both sexes shown by one exhibitor. In a new South African record price is from this week for a Bonsmara bull from Pochum Bull Bonsmara's betal. The bull, BBM 1696 in lot 8, is for a record bedrag van 2,1 million rand van die hand gesit tijdens die teller sy jaarlikse productieveiling op Stella. Die kopers was Eben Basson en Bessel Eberson. Hulle is van Barzon Brons Bosmaras by Moerevier in KwaZulu Natal. Barzon Bosmaras het ook die naashoogte prijs van 1,3 miljoen betaal vir BBM 1825. En dis dan vandagse nieuws. In our series on plant health, we focus on migratory and invasive insect pest in South Africa today. The past few years, many parts of South Africa experienced above normal locust invasion. Dr. Roger Price, a locust expert from the ARC, who also leads the research teams at the ARC on other insect pests, joins us now. Roger, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about the migratory locusts mm. and other invasive insect pests that are of, of economic importance in South Africa. Okay, we have four species of plague locust in South Africa. <clears throat> we have the, the brown locust, which is only found in the Karoo. We have the African migratory locust, which is a pest of maize and sorghum in South Africa. We have the red locust, which is uh, found in low numbers in the country, but uh, we're uh, subject to invasions from other parts of Africa. The swarms fly in. And then we have the southern African desert locust, which is found in the Kalahari. And that is a subspecies of the North African desert locust, which caused all the, the problems recently in Kenya. Uh, but that's, that locust doesn't swarm. Uh, it's just of novelty value. But uh, we have, anyway, four species of plague locusts. Then we're subject to a lot of invasive, other invasive pests. We have the African army worm coming down from Africa, um, flies in every two or three years. We have invasions of the fall army worm, which is a new pest, arrived in about 2016. We have the um, tuta absoluta tomato pest. And we have uh, various species of invasive fruit flies, of which the Asian fruit fly is the most uh, important. So being part of, you know, the, 
invasive pests do get into the country through the quarantine. They break through the quarantine uh, uh, borders. They just fly in like the full army worm flew in. In the billions of moths flew in. So we 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 have to live with what what's what what we have. What caused the large scale locust outbreak in the Karoo the past summer season, and uh, how did that outbreak compare to previous seasons? Okay, the, the brown locust, we, we have small-scale outbreaks very often, very regularly in the Karoo. Nine out of ten years over the past century, we've had locust outbreaks somewhere or other in the Karoo. However, large-scale outbreaks only occur about once a decade. And this current outbreak is perhaps the largest we've had for 40 years at least. And that occurred because of a, a good drought-breaking rains after, after a long series of drought in the Karoo. And the locust numbers built up slowly but surely over vast areas, over 250,000 square kilometers sure. of semi-arid Karoo. When the good rains fell, then the locusts came. And they, they matured and they, they bred repeatedly because there was good food and good moisture and, and the outbreak will continue as long as there's good rains in the Karoo. And I believe we've got another year coming for good with good rains. Yes, it's all to do with the <laughs> sudden ocean oscillations and El Ninos and La Ninas and whatever. So it's all connected. Mm-hmm. So what damage do they cause and how can we control them more effectively? Well, the, the locust, um, before we had modern pesticides, the brown locust used to escape from the Karoo and swarms used to invade all over southern Africa right the way up to the Zambezi causing food insecurity for all over the, all over the sub-region. Um, we, we try and maintain, keep the locust in the Karoo to protect our maize and wheat and, and sorghum crops. So it's a grass feeder. So we control locusts in the Karoo to prevent them getting out of the Karoo to, to, to safeguard our food. But in the, in the Karoo, they do eat the grass. And farmers complain that they, they compete with sheep. And they cause a lot of damage, certainly. Mm-hmm. Well, stay with us. We are talking to Dr. Roger Price from the ARC on our locust invasion, but that's not all. Stay tuned. ABE Biotech. Fermentasi is gelijk aan prestatie. Goedemorgen, kijkers. Roy Vleesprijs het weer eens gemengd voor toon in week 21 van die jaar. BSA 2 karkasprys het in 0.7% gedaal, terwyl die C2 prys 0.7% op is en die speenkalf prys met 1% gestuig het. Die tekort aan lamvlees hier die tyd van die jaar gedurende die winter is baie sterk sigbaar en die prys van A2 karkasse, die prys het tot boe die 100 rand gestuig met 3.2% week op week. C2 karkasprys is echter iets wat laar terwyl die speen lampprys ook baie skerp gestuig het met 6% week op week. Varkvleesprys 0.3% hoor. Die wol RWS skoon onweiser het met 0.3% laar gesluit in oor die vorige veiling, terwyl er geen bokker vuil waar veiling was die week nie. Die grane aanbetref het al die graan en oliesare pryse gedal week op week, geomilies 3.9% af, koring 1.5% laar, soeiebone 2.2% laar en die sonnebloem pryse 1.8% laar. Die rand het verstevigd en hier vernaamste wisselkoerse 1.4% sterker teen oor die dollar en 1.6% sterker teen oor die euro. Welcome back to our discussion with Dr. Roger Price from the ARC on uh, invasive insect pests in South Africa. And we are focusing on the locust. We all know about the damage we've gone through in the Karoo. Let's talk about the spraying, the environmental impact of the locust spraying. And um, are there any other benefits provided by the locusts? Well, the, the spraying is a concern. Um, we're using the m- most modern pesticides we, we, we can, can afford at the moment. Um, we, we have switched to, to these modern synthetic pyrethroid pesticides, which are far safer than the organochlorine and the organophosphate pesticides used in the 80s and 90s, um, which cause a lot of uh, mortalities of mammals and birds. So the insecticides we use at the moment are far safer, but they're still, they're still pesticides. Mm-hmm. 
they they kill um, a, a wide range of of insect um, organisms throughout throughout the Karoo. So so if we're only spraying small areas, then then there is a rapid recolonization of those plots. But if we're spraying large areas, then the recolonization will be a far slower. And because the Karoo is a unique uh, habitat, a unique biome. Um, we, we, there is a concern about the regular spraying of, of locusts, mm-hmm. yes, certainly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the how and the when is also important. How and when, yes. It, it, it's, it's, uh, if, if the, the uh, locusts are sprayed uh, at, at a critical time of the year when, when, the other, when other insects are breeding, then yes, it'll, it'll have a big impact, mm-hmm. certainly. And then it has an impact on the lizards and the mammals that feed on, the, on those insects. Exactly. So we're not sure of the in, in exact environmental impact, but all we know is that um, it, it's, it's safer than, than it would have been using the older style pesticides. Roger, let's move away from the locust and uh, talk about the recent invasion of new insect pests and, of course, the economic damage. Yes, the, the new insect pests. Well, we, we've had, uh, everybody knows about the invasions of the fall armyworm, which is uh, from Central and South America, and it arrived in South Africa in January 2017, and is now endemic to the country. It has settled here. It's not going to go away. It doesn't impact the commercial farmers so much because they're using, um, they, they can spray, and they, they've got a, a genetically modified maize. But it has a severe impact on the smallholder farmers that are using traditional pollinated maize. Uh, we have another pest, uh, the Tuta absoluta, which is the tomato pinworm. That an, arrived in 2016, and that ha- is having a devastating effect uh, on tomato production, especially with smallholder farmers. We have to spray more and more and more, and uh, it's going to lead to resistance buildup. And then we have other pests, such as the Asian fruit fly, that arrived in 2010, and that is a major worry as well. Mm. Now we need advice from you. How can farmers control these pests? What is your advice? Well, well, controlling the pests is, is, is rotate the, the pesticides used. Commercial farmers or farmers that can, can have access to pesticides and have access to information and technology, we must be very careful that we don't cause insecticide resistance buildup. That is critical. So at the moment, it, the advice is to rotate the pesticides according to the, the guidelines given by government and to, 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 to ensure and to monitor the pests, do monitoring and know when your pest thresholds are. So it's no point spraying just because it's a Tuesday and you spray. You've got to know what the numbers of pests are in your crop before you, you have that critical threshold. We're most worried about the smallholder farmers, the thousands and thousands of smallholder farmers that are going to be driven out of business. They, they have small areas of land. They, they don't have the resources and the finance to afford the, the pesticides. They often don't have access to information and technology, and they, they, they're not diversified. They, they plant maize or tomatoes, or they, they don't have a range of things to, to, to back themselves up if there's a hard time. So the, the resilience of those farmers is, is at risk, and that is what we're most concerned about, is, is, the, is driving small-scale farmers out of business because the, the, the invasive pests are the last straw. And that, that is, happens all over Africa. And uh, the locusts were the last straw to a lot of farmers in Kenya. And tuta and full armyworm and possibly locusts here. And, and the Asian fruit fly will be the last straw here. Unless we, unless we support farmers more effectively. Mm. Roger, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. I think we've got lots more to talk about uh, on this yes. subject. You'll have to come in again. Thank you. Come and much. join us. That's uh, Dr. Roger Price from the ARC. BKB, die betrouwbare tuiste van landbouw. BKB, the trusted home 
of agriculture. Ilanco, we are driven by our vision of food and companionship enriching life. On the outskirts of Polokwane in the Limpopo province lies more than 80 years of excellence and a reputation for superior pig genetics. This is because Mockford Farms not only focuses on developing genetics that will make its customers more profitable, but also aspires to improve the eating experience of the consumer while taking the welfare of their production animals seriously. This looks like a party. What is this? <laughs> okay, so now this is all pregnant sows in this house here. And again, they've come down, let's say, just from the service house. And they've taken a nice slow walk into these big pens that you can see it's got lots of access to light and natural air. Um, and they're in here for just less than three months, three weeks and three days from here to the farrowing house. Okay, and what are these crates for? The crates are there for the naughty sows, or let's say the sows that want to get away from the naughty sows. Every now and again there is one or two that decides to go and try and steal one of the other pigs' foods, uh, or food, and um, so it's, it does protect them. They are also you know, they have their own social environment, so some of them like to have their own private space in a, in a crate, and some of them like to just lie on top of each other. <laughs> That's just the way they are. But as you can tell, there's no gates on these crates, and there ne never has been on this farm, and there certainly never will be any crates on this farm during this gestation period. They've got access to a lot of space. So just explain why is this important for welfare? Well, there's a lot happening, you know, in, in the sow's body at the moment. I mean, she's potentially, you know, got between 10 or 12 or again, like I said earlier on, 22 piglets. And she needs to make sure that she's in the right conditions to, to be able to carry all the way to fairing. She doesn't have the right nutrition, if she's under stress, um, if she's in an environment that is not suitable to her, she's going to abort. Naturally, that's what animals do, they're going to abort. So we do need to make sure that the conditions that they're in during this extremely important time is favorable to the sow. So our goal is to have 800 to 850 wieners move to the next facility every single week. So it's, it's a big cycle, lots of pressure, 52 weeks of the year, but everything has to happen according to plan. We somehow slip up along the way, we don't reach that target, and that'll put a huge um, knock-on effect on us at this facility. I can imagine. So what do you say you do, what would you say you do differently than other farmers in this first phase? We care. I, mean, I think we just, you know, I'd like to think that everybody cares, but you know, somewhere along the line, maybe bigger farmers have lost that, that sense of care and passion, but it's been installed with us over three generations to, to care and be passionate about these lovely animals and um, not just chase the dollar at the end of the day. It's about making sure that overall you've got a good symbiotic relationship or a good relationship with your sales and farm and make sure that you, you know, put this all together together. So what do you do to care for these animals? We've, we've installed that passion into our staff. If your staff aren't passionate, I can't be here all the time to catch pigs. Um, you know, so they've got that care as well. These pigs were born last night, and each one of them would have been tile dried, hand tile dried with a specific tile to just for this pen itself. Um, there's not many 
farmers or there's not many attendees in these facilities that would do that on, on every farm. And then of course we put a huge emphasis into the sow as well and her recovery. And some of them could have up to 22 piglets born alive. Wow. In each, in each pairing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's massive numbers. And there's a lot happening in the psychology of her and just the um, her, her body trying to recover from that. So it's important that we get, get her back to recovery as quickly as possible. So what happens after this? Where are we going next? Okay, so every, every Thursday, um, we have that, that set amount of wieners that we go on to the next facility as we are multi-site uh, farm. And as soon as they move from here, the sows take a slow, leisure walk and they can take as long as they want. They get quite a bit of sunshine outside, they play. Some of them yeah, cause a bit of destruction on the way, but yeah, we, we don't mind. There's no rush. They've, they've been in here for four weeks. So yeah, they, they take their time getting back to the service house and in the service house, yeah, the whole new cycle starts again. And in the following Tuesday after weaning, a lot of the sows would be reserved again. Uh, which is incredible to, to be able to have an animal that would cycle that quick again after weaning. So Leanside is our main genetic hub and definitely one of my most favorite sites. This is where a lot happens. Uh, we've got our three breeds that we keep absolutely pure here. Um, the large white land race as our dam line and uh, the big beautiful Jerok as our terminal site. And so all that we're doing here is that we're importing semen from Denmark and uh, we are put, choosing the best sows to put uh, the imported semen on so that we can make as quick genetic progress as possible. So you have a nice Dan bread shirt on there. What's the relationship there? So we started up a really nice link with uh, Dan bread International back in 2017. And at that stage, we felt there was another need for uh, alternative or uh, another option of genetics in South Africa. We were also looking at something that we felt would be the best for commercial farmers and something that we found very quickly within Danbury International is that they knew about modern farming and genetic improvements and the importance of efficiency and uh, so it just made the most perfect choice to link up with uh, Danbred. And at that stage, we had a perfect collaboration with other partners uh, in the, in, within South Africa, with vets, uh, with industry role players that uh, made it all possible. So while we're on the topic of genetics, how does that impact the meat that you produce? That mostly comes down to the Jurok. The Jurok is very well known across the world just for its particularly amazing meat quality and uh, the whole time we are constantly selecting for that carcass quality if it's leanness or fast growth but that comes down to the terminal jerok. How does it work here? What's happening? What's going on? So this is actually the starting point so how we get uh, our genetic progress here out to our customers. So we bring in frozen semen uh, into the lab and from here we can thaw it out. We then choose the absolutely best sows that get selected for um, the frozen semen. And then from there that eventually gets out to the customers in, in the best way possible. Ilanko, we are driven by our vision of food and companionship enriching life.